foundations have been shaken. But today, here in the power of Christ, we stand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let's put a little clap emoji on for Fal and the team this morning, and, and maybe for our technical team as well, who've been working extra hard this past few weeks. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Great to have you with us this morning, and uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have been watching us over the past few weeks, you will know we're looking uh, at this series called Who Am I? <clears throat> and we're looking at this whole concept of, of knowing who we are, knowing who we are in Christ, and then we're going to look at who Christ is in us. And we've been singing about that this morning. And so this morning we're going to look at coping with crisis. Last week we, we touched on this, but our theme scripture has been about wholeness. And 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, it tells us this, God's interested in us being whole. It says, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Because you can't be whole without holiness. The two go hand in hand. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body. And we've been looking about, uh, looking at this whole concept of how wholeness brings us peace, brings us health, uh, and just makes us complete person. God, God's interested in us being whole. And so we've looked at our chromosomes and how we've had all these this DNA passed on to us from our parents and those who came before us, and how they've not only given us our physical attributes, but they've also given us our temperaments and things which affect our character and also affect our, our uh, personalities. And then we looked at how our family cultures then affect that, also how they nurture us. Then we looked at the customs in our, in our nation and how customs affect our way of thinking, depending how we brought up and the culture and, and customs we were brought up in. Then last week, we began to look at crises. And we saw that crises was any event that created an unstable situation or a dangerous situation. A crisis is a, is a testing time or an emergency. And of course, we've been going through a crisis uh, called a pandemic in the past year. But we began to look at mental health. And mental, in mental health terms, the crisis is not necessarily the traumatic, traumatic event itself, but it's how we respond to it. And so one person can respond to a crisis and it devastates them. Another person can breeze through it as if, oh, well, whatever, it's easy. And we saw that the Chinese word for crisis is made up of two characters, danger and opportunity. And so we have saw in the last year how some people have struggled, but other people really have thrived, in the, particularly in the business area. The 10 wealthiest men in the world have increased their uh, wealth by 400 billion pounds. So one person person's crisis is another person's opportunity. And so we saw it was an opportunity for growth or decline. We saw there were different types of crises. The developmental crisis, that's the crisis of just growing up. Childhood, adolescence can be a crisis for some people. Midlife crisis, just go on to the next wee slide there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, midlife crisis, old age can be a crisis existential crisis. What's life all about? Why am I here? What am I achieving? Why am I on this earth? Those deep questions. And we talked about this on Tuesday night, actually. And it's surprising how many people ask themselves those questions in life, more than you would think. And uh, then we looked at situational crises, which is the one we understand the, the, the most, because it's when circumstances go wrong, when life throws us a curveball and something happens that we weren't expecting. Like this time last year, we weren't expecting to be locked down for a year. It's fair enough, isn't it? Uh, life was turned on its head. And so situational crises can affect us. We saw that this can create acute trauma, uh, something resulting from a major incident that happened in your life, chronic trauma, which is probably where most people are now because it's going on and on. This is repeated and prolonged exposure to stressful events. We think, oh, we're out of the lockdown. We're into the lockdown. We're out of the lockdown. We're into the lockdown. We're out of the lockdown. We're into the lockdown. And so think, what is going on? And then there's complex trauma where we 
find people who their life seems to be one crisis after the other. And those, those people, for whatever reason, seem to get into situations where they just bounce from crisis to crisis. We saw uh, then that our bodies react when we're under stress and anxiety. All sorts of things can happen. And we had great discussion about this on Tuesday night. And we all realized, okay, we've all had some sort of anxiety or stress because we've all had, had some of these things affect our body, whether it's a sense of doom or fatigue or blood pressure or sweats or headaches, whatever it was. We finished off last week then by looking at some ways of coping with stress and anxiety and crisis. And uh, again, these came up on Tuesday evening as we discussed this. Proverbs 12 says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And so some people said they went through a crisis and so they had counseling. They met with a counselor. It could be pastoral care. It's good to talk it out because you're thinking I'm the only person going through this and my world's shattered a bit of you talk it through with someone and a good word encourages you. The Bible encourages then in First Peter to cast that care, that anxiety, that crisis, that response onto the Lord because he took it for us. And of course, Philippians tells us, well, don't be anxious about anything. Pray about it. Thank the Lord that you're still here, that he's in control and, and prayer and these different things then are coping mechanisms. We're going to look at a few more uh, concepts and coping with crisis this morning. And so I'm wanting to look, I'm going to look at a businessman in, in the Old Testament. And so this was a shrewd businessman. Uh, he was hedging his bets. This person had six income streams in their portfolio. That'd be good to have, wouldn't it? Most of us are happy to have one income stream at the minute. Some of us have a full-time job and then a, a part-time job. So we have two uh, income streams. Maybe we live in a family where there's two people working with two income streams and we think, oh, we're in the pig's back. We have two income streams. But this guy had six income streams. This was a smart man. This was a shrewd man. He had prepared and planned for a successful future. So imagine this guy this time last year. He thinks, I'm all set up for the year. 200, 2020 is going to be a great year. I have six potential income streams here. What can go wrong? I've hedged my bets. I have everything in place. Think of the number of business people. Think of the number of people in work who this time last year thought, happy days, I'm set up now. I have my business, I have my restaurant, I have my job, I have whatever it is. And today they're not sure if there's a future or not. And so for many people, I talk to many business people, throughout uh, this past few months, and they've had to diversify. They've had to, people who have had restaurants are now making meals, ready meals to, to, to sell in, in corner shops and convenience stores and this sort of thing. So people have had to then, like the Chinese symbols, take the crisis and make an opportunity out of it just to survive, not because it was something they wanted to do, because, but because it was something they had to do. And so here's this guy, he's all set up for success with the six income streams, and then look what happens. Some of you may have heard of this guy, he's called Habakkuk. If you're watching from America, you call him Habakkuk, however you get that out of it. I do not know, but that's Americans for you. And so this guy's all set up, and then look what happens. His figs don't blossom, the fig trees fail. So he's thinking, oh, fig trees have failed. Thank goodness of another five income streams. But you know, the fig tree failing just doesn't affect Habakkuk. It affects his workers. He's maybe going to have to lay some workers off here. It affects the supply chain. It affects the people that were selling his figs in the shop. For those of you who are older, it affects Jimmy Figarty. You can put a note on Facebook. If you, were, you probably need to be over 40 does anybody in the room know who Jimmy Figurey is? They're all young people here. They're all looking at me as if, what is he talking about? Jacob's ad years ago had a guy called Jimmy Figurey, and he was the only guy in the world who knew how to put the figs in Jacob fig roll. That was a great job to have. You were sought after. If you were the person, the only person in the world who had the secret, you were going to be able to name your price, aren't you? But for Jimmy Figurey, if he has no figs, his job 
is useless. I'm going to say something there, but it sounded rude. His job is, is finished. And so how many people in this season, because something happened, it has a knock-on effect. It wasn't just Habakkuk was affected. It was a staff. It was a supply chain. So many of us have been in that situation. But at least with Habakkuk, he's thinking, well, thank goodness I hedged my bets. I didn't just go for figs. I have other income streams. Then there's no fruit on his vines. For goodness sake, that's not working out well. You know, we think of vines, we think of grapes, don't we? So he could have had an aspect of his business, could have been grapes. But vines, other, there's other fruit have vines. Melons grow on a vine, just grows along the ground. Uh, kiwis grow on vines. It's a little bit of education for you who don't know this. Another fruit that grows on the vine is tomatoes. Now, here's the, if you want to understand what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is, Knowledge is understanding and knowing that tomato is a fruit. Some of you didn't know tomato is a fruit. Do you think it's a salad vegetable? Knowing that tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in the fruit salad. And so, these two fail. His vines fail. The man from De Monte, you go on to the next slide. Again, this is for, I'm not going to do this with everything. Don't panic. This is for the over 40s. The man from Del Monte, he used to come along into the vineyard or into the fruit fields and he would have taken a peach or he had taken the melon or the fruit. Say, the man from Del Monte, he say yes. And when he gave it the thumbs up, then they were able to take it off and stick it in a can. Now, the funny thing about this is, and some of you, Andy, may remember this. 30 years ago, you see this cream suit that the man from Del Monte, that this was the uniform of Pentecostals 30 years ago. I used to have one of the, I didn't have the Panama hat. I used to have one of these cream suits and I had cream crocodile style shoes and white socks. When I think about it now, it makes me cringe. And I used to go to Hills Breedham and I would say half the men in Hills Breedham had Balmer, Balmer, German, cream suits, cream crocodile shoes, and white socks. If ever there was a cult, that was it. So the man from Del Monte, Del Monte, he's lost his job now. He has nowhere to go. So again, things are not looking up here. But what happens is olives fail. So he's beginning to think, well, there's four things left. Now I've only three things left. His the olives, I'm not going to do anything with olives, don't panic. His olives fail. And so he now has three things left, uh, income opportunities left in his portfolio. Then his fields produce no fruit. His wheat, his barley, his potatoes, his cabbages, his carrots, whatever he had planted. Imagine all that time and effort of sowing, of preparing tilling the ground, preparing the ground, of buying seed, of planting. Not only has he not got a harvest, but he's lost the investment that he's put in. This is, this is a crisis. This is now becoming a crisis. This is becoming really, really stressful. Then his flock, his sheep, there's no sheep, there's no lambs. Doesn't tell us what happens here, but the, the, the fold is empty. There's no produce from the fold. And then finally, there's no cattle in the stalls. Every income stream wiped out. There's a guy potentially could head for a nervous breakdown. You think of the effort. He, he, he just hasn't been some lazy guy sitting back saying, K, sarah, sarah, it'll all work out. I'll go and sign on. There was no signing on in Habakkuk's days. He was diligent, he was forward planning, he was forward thinking, he was preparing, he was diligent, he was investing, and every ounce of that hard work just was gone. That was, that's devastating. And so, naturally speaking, this guy should have been devastated. But look what he says. I did, these verses blew me away. He said, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. Now, as I began to look at this, I thought, wow, there, you talk about concepts for dealing with crisis. 
I never seen this before till I began to look into it in more detail. And this is why I often say, don't speed read the scriptures. We're talking about wholeness. We're talking about body, soul, and spirit. I often say, the spirit's prospered anyway. The body will always follow what the soul tells us to do. So our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions are the deciding factor. So look what he says, I will. He makes a choice of his will. He chooses, I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. Now, this isn't an unusual word in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, because we think rejoicing, I'll do a bit of singing, have a bit of a happy, clappy time. It actually means, the word means to jump for joy. Isn't that interesting? Not jump with joy. There's nothing to jump with joy for here. Now, if you were married and your wife had a baby, and the, the doctor comes out and says, your wife's had a healthy baby, boy or girl, whatever you were expecting, you could jump with joy because you have something to be joyful about. Somebody comes in, you want a million pounds in the, in the lottery, you could jump with joy. But this guy has nothing to jump with joy, with joy about. But the Bible says he's to jump for joy. And so what's the difference? It's interesting because Jesus said something similar. He said, when you're persecuted, when men revile you, when men speak all evil against you, leap for joy, jump for joy. So what does that mean? That means we don't necessarily have the joy because it's not a joyful situation. But this always reminds me of something. If you have something in your garage that you need or something on a high shelf that you need, you don't have it. But if you jump for it, you might have to jump to get it. And so this is an act of faith. This is a saying, I may not have the joy, the circumstances don't land me to be joyful, but I'm going to jump in faith. I'm going to jump for that joy because I know in the spirit it's there. This is an amazing concept. This is an amazing thing. So he makes a choice of his will to rejoice, to jump for joy. Then he goes on to say, I will choose to shout in exultation. Now, when you read that without looking up the meaning of the word, you think, well, that's good. He's getting fairly noisy about this, and he's putting things into practice. But the words and the phrase here means to spin around under the violent emotion of gladness and joy. So he starts to spin around. I'll not do that too often because it'll be on my back. It's okay for you young people. He starts to spin around. He starts to dance. He starts to violently, when you look up, this is a violent word. This is not just a wee dance. This is a, a swirling round and dancing and shouting unto God. He says, I will shout. I will choose to shout in exultation, spin around under the violent emotion of gladness and joy. Here's the emotion coming in now. It didn't start off with emotion. What would emotion do? Emotion say, I'm not getting out of bed this morning. If we kick off with our emotions, if we lead with our emotions, our emotions will take us on a downward path. We'll just say, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm pulling the covers over my head and I'm not moving from here because I done all this work. I put all this into, and look what God has done on me. It's, it's, I'm just not moving. But because he got it in God's order, because he understood how this works, he made a choice he chose to jump for joy. He chose to get his will in the right place. And then his emotions followed after him. Now, you think, well, that's very good. But here's what's even better about this. Because before we understood how the brain worked, before we understood about endorphins, before we understood about physical exercise, this guy was putting into practice what the medics tell us now. Because look at aerobic exercise. What he was doing was aerobic exercise. When you exercise, your body releases chemicals such as dopamine and endorphins in your brain that make you feel happy. See, he wasn't feeling particularly happy, but as he began to spin, as he began to shout, as he began to exercise, what happened? His heart began to beat faster. His lungs began to expand. His brain began to then release dopamine and endorphins in the brain that make you feel happy. Not only is your brain producing feel-good chemicals, but exercise also helps your brain to get rid of the chemicals that make you feel stressed and anxious. Isn't that interesting? I had these notes done. I discovered this 10 minutes before I came out this morning as I thought 
about it a little bit more, as I meditated about it a little bit more, I thought, I read this again, thought, what is all this spinning around and violent emotion and gladness? And what's all this about? And then the penny dropped. Hold on, this totally ties in with what we understand about coping with stress and crisis and dealing with these things. The more sedentary you are, the more these things come in upon you, but the more you exercise, think, well, I couldn't spin around. I'm not able to, well, go for a walk. Well, I'm not able to, what will swim? Do something that begins to get your heart beating, that gets your lungs pumping, that gets your brain expelling those things that will cause you anxiety and depression and release those things, the happy hormone, as the, the doctors would call it. And so this guy, Habakkuk, thousands of years ago, understood how God had made us. He understood how it works led with his will, brought his emotions into submission, realized that there was a will aspect to it, there was an emotional aspect to it, but there was a physical aspect to walking in victory, even in the most negative situations. We can all do that, can't we? We can do all of those things. Look what he begins to shout to the Lord as he's, as he's in exaltation. The Lord is my strength. He's not saying, oh, it's okay for Connor and Jordan. They've got a God that loves them. No, he's saying, the Lord uh, God is my strength. He's declaring, he's prophesying, he's declaring strength over his situation, over his body. The Lord is my personal bravery. You need bravery in these situations. When you've put everything you have, every ounce of energy into something, and it goes belly up like this, then you really need to know, you need to have a personal bravery to recover from that. He says, he's my source. The Lord's my source of courage. He's my invincible army. I've got an army. I've got an invincible army. I've got an invisible, invincible army. Remember the prophet said to his assistant, you can't see it, but I'm going to ask God to open your eyes. And then he saw thousands of angels, God's invincible army working behind the scenes on his behalf. You see, if we will put God's order, God's concept, God's practices into place, things will happen behind the scenes. God is working on our behalf, doing things that we don't know about. We just have to do our part. He goes on to say this, He has made, he has made my feet steady and sure, like Heinz feet, not Heinz 57 varieties, Heinz as in the doe, a deer, a female deer. So, what's the next bit? So a needle pulling thread far. No, I'm not going to sing it. You're okay. Don't panic, Andy. If you want to know about this, go to the sound of music. So this is a doe. The thing about a hind, it's amazing. Look at the, hopefully you can see the picture. This is a sheer cliff face. And these hinds, these doe are able to walk along it and climb up places that nobody else can climb. In fact, the thing about a hind is its hind feet, when it goes forward, its hind feet have the ability to land in exactly the same places its front feet were in before it took it next step. Talk about four wheel drive. It's quite amazing. So when it moves forward, its hind feet go exactly into the spot its front feet were. And that's why it can be so steady and so secure. And so he's saying, This is what you've done for me, Lord. In the midst of this disaster, in the midst of this crisis, you have made my feet steady and sure. And the example I'm using to help me understand it is the doe, the deer, a female deer. The hind, I, I, I can see as I look at that hind, this is what you're doing for me in the spiritual and in the physical. Look what he goes on to say. He says, he makes me walk not to stand in terror. And so what have we here? We have a deer in the headlights. See, in Habakkuk's day, there were no headlights because they hadn't invented the light bulb. But this is basically what he's saying. You see, what does crisis do? Crisis sometimes can paralyze us in fear. You get those brown envelopes with the wee window 
through your ladder box. You're terrified before you even open it. It says HMRC on it or something. You think, ah, oh, what have I done? Have I do more tax. You know, one of those that have I been speeding, have this, that, the other thing. And so crises can cause us to stand still. But he says, no, no, not in God, not what God does for us. He makes me walk forward. Because if that deer stands still and the vehicle comes, what's going to happen? It's going to be venison chops or whatever lamb deers turned out to be. It's going to be run over. And so the devil will try to run you over. The, de the, the devil will try to paralyze you. In this pandemic time, so many people have become paralyzed. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to move forward. They don't know what to do. They're just, they're just stuck. They're like the deer in the headlights. And, and Habakkuk said, no, no, that's not how God operates. God causes me to walk forward. When this pandemic's over, if it's ever over, we will be walking on in God to the next thing that God has for us. We're not going to be stuck in the headlights. We're not going to be backwards. We're going to be moving forwards in him, not standing in terror. God doesn't want us to be in terror in whatever crisis is happening in your life. He goes on to say, but he wants us to walk forward with spiritual confidence. You see, crises... We'll look a bit more about this when we look at curses and we look at choices. Crises can happen because of different things. Sometimes we cause the crisis. Sometimes it's just a crisis that's in the world because we live in a fallen world. There can be different reasons for crisis. But crises tend to knock our spiritual confidence. We talked a little bit about this a bit last week. If your self-belief about yourself is, well, God loves me and I'm his favorite, when a crisis comes, you think, that devil, I'm not going to give him the, the privilege and the pleasure of ruining my life. But if you have low self-esteem and you're thinking, mm, God's against me, then you're thinking, God's, God's brought this into my life to teach me a lesson. And so crises sometimes can dent and stop us moving forward and affect our spiritual confidence. So the New Testament tells us, don't cast away your confidence in God because with it comes great great reward. And, and so confidence, the enemy would want our confidence in God, our spiritual confidence to be gone in this season. He would want it to be dented. Well, where's God? Why is this lasting so long? Why is God not intervening? Well, we don't know. God maybe has a bigger purpose. God didn't cause coronavirus. Probably the people that are making the vaccines caused it, but that's just a suggestion. That's probably, I'll probably get taken to court for saying that. I would say, follow the money. Those 10 people who became wealthier uh, since the pandemic, follow the money, you'll know what's happening. And so walk forward with spiritual confidence. Make spiritual progress upon my high places. That's interesting. What does that mean? We'll look at that just in the next slide. But he says, make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, challenge, suffering, crisis, or responsibility. I think it was Joyce Meyer coined the phrase, new level, new devil. And so God is always wanting to bring us up higher. If you read in Revelation, the apostle John said, I heard a voice and it said, come up higher. See, when God speaks to us, he's always, uh, he's always wanting to bring us up higher. There's a new level in God from faith to faith, from glory to glory. God's bringing us to the next level. It's his desire to bring us to the next level. And even in crises, he can bring us up higher because we've come to a new place of authority if we understand this stuff. If we can find ourselves in crisis, if we can find ourselves in, in challenge in these different things that uh, Habakkuk talks about here and are overcoming in these things, we move to a new level in God. We move to a new level of spiritual confidence, of spiritual progress. You see, in the Old Testament, the high places were the places of idol worship to false gods. So, and so you see many times that there were good kings who pulled down the high places because they were sacrificing to idols. They were, they were doing those things. And so the New Testament refers to this as well. The New Testament talks about philosophies, ideologies, false religions as high things, as high places. 
that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So what does crises do? It comes into this arena. Crises come and it's in your face and it's a challenge against you and what God's doing in your life, isn't it? You sit in the pandemic, you can't get to church. You have to watch online. Think, what is going on here? It's a challenge to your faith. It's a challenge to your belief in God. It's a challenge to your progress. It's a challenge to all those things. Habakkuk is declaring that no crisis or disaster can keep us from reaching the heights of blessing and mountaintop experiences that God has for us. Isn't that powerful? God is saying there's no demon in hell, there's no devil, there's no crisis that can stop you fulfilling what I'm calling you to fulfill. While the crisis is on, while Habakkuk was in this situation, he was proving God's faithfulness. He was understanding God's concepts of how to cope in crisis. The Bible doesn't tell us how he came out the other side, but we see a similar story with Job. He went through a crisis, but the wreck, and it was nine months later, he came out with double everything that he had before going in, except wives, I think it was, which is handy. Because one of those is enough for anybody. All right, Connor. So what can we learn from Habakkuk just as, as we're finishing? Well, God's ways are not, not our ways. And yet he can be trusted. You know, God sometimes allows things to happen. God's sovereign. He's in control. We don't always understand, but we can trust God. As I often say, there's a place beyond faith, and that's trust even when things seem chaotic, God is still in control. That's good to know, isn't it? We've lived in a chaotic year, but God is still in control. God wants the best for us, even when it's hard. And you know, God's, God's not so much interested in our comfort, but he's interested in our progress in him, in our development in him. Understanding how God's uh, God works is not my job, but trusting him is. We just sometimes think, oh God, what was that all about? Sometimes we get the answer down the road a little bit and say, hmm, see what you were doing there. Sometimes we'll not get the answer until we get to heaven. So understanding how God works is not my job, but trusting him is. Peace and joy don't come from my circumstances, but they come from God. Very, very clear with Habakkuk that that is the case. And just as we finish, I'm going to ask the band to come just on this last one. My timing is just that. It's my timing. But God's timing is perfect. And so there's things in life that we would, we would change the timing of. If I had the choice, I would have everybody back in church this morning there are things, timings that we don't understand, but God's timing is perfect. And the key to this is that we don't waste time in this season. You see, this is not a waiting time. This is a spiritual progressing time. This is a time to move forward. This is a time to believe God. This is a time to know, who am I? Who is God in, in me? Who am I in him? All these different things that as we release to do other things, we've, we've trained ourselves. Spoken to a number of people this week, and they're saying, the world I live in, the world of accountancy, the world of admin, it's changing because of cloud, the cloud system and how things are done. And I've said to these people, you need to upskill. Every day is a learning day. And it's the same in crisis. Every day needs to be a learning day. How do we learn to cope with crisis? How do we learn to take it? And instead of it being a disaster, it becomes an opportunity for growth. How do we become better and not bitter? How do we grow to the next stage? How do we come up higher? And I believe as we put these concepts for coping with crisis into, into play, then we will find ourselves spiritually growing spiritually progressing and it doesn't matter what crisis or what the enemy throws at us we will move on in God thank you for listening
Let the King of my be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song, because you are good. today and he's not the king of your heart maybe you've joined us for the first time maybe you're watching a regular basis 
maybe you enjoy watching, but maybe you haven't made him the king of your heart. Why not do it today? Maybe you'd like to just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on a cross for me. I realize that I'm a sinner and that's why you had to die. And today I confess my sin. I give it over to you. I ask you to cleanse me with your precious blood. I ask you to come and live in my life by your spirit. Today I want to become a child of God. I want you to be the king of my heart and have the fire of the Holy Spirit within my veins. I give my life to you, Lord Jesus. I choose to serve you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. You know, if you've prayed that this morning, drop us a little line, put something on Facebook, just let us know that we can be praying for you. And in these days of crises, these days of stress, may we be like Habakkuk. May we choose, may we make a choice of our wills to jump for joy, to worship you, to praise you, to understand that you're in control so that our emotions and our body are in right order so that we can be those whole people, spirit, soul, and body. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A big thank you again to Fal and the team. And uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see some of you during the week on Zoom. If not, we will see you next week. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen.